I would like to call the regular meeting of the Comox Valley Regional District of Tuesday, March 21st to order. I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation, the traditional keepers of this land, and we are grateful for their past and present stewardship. Uh, before welcoming our first delegation, I would like to cover a few basic protocols to ensure our meeting is conducted in a respectful and orderly fashion. I'm mindful that some of the items to be discussed at this meeting are controversial and emotionally charged, and I need to ensure that we have a fair, safe, and productive meeting. This meeting is not a public hearing, so public presentations are facilitated through the dele delegations to the board, Therefore, only those members of the public presenting as a delegation will be allowed to speak today. It is imperative that we ensure a safe environment for everyone by conducting ourselves in a civil and respectful manner. In this regard, shouting or heckling during the presentations from the delegations or during the subsequent deliberations will not be tolerated. I will also ask that you refrain from any um, positive reinforcement by clapping. We just would want, don't want to disrupt uh, deliberations at all, so um, silence is requested. As chair, I will be conducting this meeting in accordance with these principles, and I remind members of the public who may wish to follow up on an individual basis after the meeting that bullying, intolerance, racist or discriminatory behavior towards directors or staff is not acceptable in any form. Thank you in advance for your support and adherence. So to, um, today we have the recognition of the territories, which we've done, but we also have um, as a commitment to uh, reconciliation, the uh, call to action 21 from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. We continue to educate ourselves on its contents and today uh, the topic is, is on health. We call upon the federal government to provide uh, sustainable funding for existing and new Aboriginal healing centers to address the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual harms caused by residential schools and to ensure that the funding of healing centers in Nunavut and Northwest Territories is a priority. Thank you. And we move on to adoption of minutes from February 28th. Moved by Greaves, seconded by Grant. Any discussion of those minutes? And it's a vote of the full board, all in favor? Any opposed, that's carried. And we have business arising. There's a correction for minutes from February 13th. Uh, moved by Grant, seconded by Cole Hamilton. And the CAO recommendation is that the minutes from the Electoral Area Service Committee of February 13th be amended so that the correct allocation of $2,500 to the Port Alberni project Society is passed. And this vote of full board, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. And so we do move on to delegations. And first we have Mosaic Forest Management, Molly Hudson and David Bellanese. Bellani? Oh, okay. And Colin. All right. Um, no, we can't yet. I see. There we go. Right. I see it. Great. Go. Thank and you. And so, so you have 10 minutes uh, for your delegation and then um, questions if you're willing after. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us here today. I'd uh, like to echo uh, a grateful acknowledgement of the uh, uh, traditional territory of the Comox First Nation and uh, also thank this uh, organization for having us here today. Um, my name is Molly Hudson. I'm the Director of Sustainability at Mosaic. I'm joined by Colin Cosman, who's the Land Use Forester on the Sustainability Team. And we'd just like to take this opportunity to provide you with an update um, on Mosaic's uh, activities. We saw you here virtually last year, so happy to be back in person. Um, I'll give you just a few highlights on what Mosaic uh, has been up to the last year. I'd like to touch on our forest climate initiative again. Um, Colin will run us through some updates related to our activities near Langley Lake and some of our work in the community, and then we'd happily take questions if uh, the chair deems that there's time. 
So just a couple of key achievements from Mosaic for 2022. We just received recognition again as one of BC's top employers. Um, so uh, that's the second year in a row for us. We're very proud of that. One of the things that is highlighted in that application is the work that we're doing around diversity, equity, and inclusion, not just at our company, but in the forest sector as a whole. Um, in terms of community giving, last year we donated over half a million dollars to organizations big and small across the coast of BC, including one we just celebrated recently um, with the Yana Big Love Gala, a very important organization here in the Valley. In 2022, we invested over $170,000 in First Nations scholarship training programs and other support. So very much working towards um, reconciliation and respectful acknowledgement of, of our co-management um, and uh, investment in the forest sector by First Nations. One of uh, the other highlights from last year was our recertification to the Sustainable Forestry Initiative Standard. And um, one thing that has changed from that annual certification process that happens is a new objective around climate smart forestry. Um, it's broadly acknowledged by the IPCC and other organizations that forests play a key role in addressing climate change and in storing carbon. So um, this recertification to the SFI standard is well aligned with the work that we've been doing on climate solutions, which includes um, comprehensive regional climate modeling, infrastructure upgrading for increased uh, storms, collaborative watershed research, and in particular today, I'd like to talk a bit more about the Big Coast Forest, Forest Climate Initiative. I spoke about this last year. We announced it about a year ago. Um, and uh, this is a voluntary carbon crediting initiative in which 40,000 hectares of our private forest lands are to be deferred from harvest for 25 years and potentially longer. Um, the majority of these areas are old forests and by removing these forests from our baseline harvest plan, um, we increase carbon storage, uh, we avoid the emissions that are associated with logging operations, and the initiative will result in the reduction of more than 20 million tons of CO2 emissions over the life of the project. Um, you see the, the five UN Sustainable Development Goals in the bottom corner there, we've been audited to meet those goals. And in addition, we have two project partners, which aren't shown here, the Pacific Salmon Foundation and the Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas Innovation Center are both collaborators and they're funded through this project as well. And we will be working with them on the future of these lands over the next 25 years. The areas for this initiative are distributed throughout our land base um, and over 4,000 of the hectares of, of this project are located in the Comox Valley and in, in particular or in the Comox Lake watershed. Um, so we think this initiative brings benefits both to our organization, um, but also to ecosystems and to communities. Um, we continue to be very excited about this, this program. Um, it is an emerging tool in private land management, and uh, we think that the co-benefits are something to be celebrated. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Colin, who's going to provide some updates on Langley Lake. Great, thanks Molly, and uh, thanks again for having Mosaic here to present today. So I just wanted to give you an update on Langley Lake and talk a little bit about uh, watershed management. And really for Mosaic, watershed management is guided by science-based decisions and professional oversight. So this is done through our independent watershed assessments and standard operating procedures. So really valuable piece uh, for watershed management. And, in terms of security and public access, you know, our investments include uh, investing in smart gates, preventing illegal dumping and ATV or motorized uh, vehicles in the watershed. So this protects the environment really for everyone, for Mosaic's land base and for the uh, drinking watershed. We invest a lot of money in roads and bridges, and these provide access not only for Mosaic, but also for local government, uh, water purveyors, staff, and um, you know access to infrastructure in the watershed. And this includes gates and signage, so uh, different costs there. 
Um, in terms of our asset and Langley Lake and the watershed itself, wildfire prevention is key, especially human caused fires. So during wildfire season, we have a heavy lift helicopter on contract. We do daily surveillance flights. Um, we have an active agreement with the BC Wildfire Service and our staff are all trained and equipped to fight wildfires. Um, so really this investment helps reduce the number of human caused fires in watersheds, which is really important for our land base, for our asset, uh, for our neighbors and for local communities and for drinking watersheds themselves. Part of sustainable forest management is reforestation and our business is very good at growing and managing trees. Our seed orchards and planting programs with climate resili resilient stock give us success here. So just another really key part about management and watersheds. So professionals and sustainable forest management supply, support clean drinking water and supports water management services. So just specifically with Langley Lake and the 2023 activities we have planned. So we have a spring harvest scheduled. Um, if you look at the map on the screen, one polygon is almost outside of the entire watershed. Another polygon within the watershed is approximately six hectares in size. It's 100% second growth, variable retention. So there's dispersed individual leaf trees prescribed. There's also external retention prescribed. And as Molly talked about the Big Coast Forest Carbon Initiative, uh, the green area around Langley Lake is part of our green, uh, part of our, pardon me, Big Coast Forest Car Climate Initiative. So obvious values there. We've had requests from uh, CVRD water purveyors each year to replace one drainage structure on Hancock, Maine. Uh, so we'll be doing that this year at our cost. And we're also a longtime supporter of the Fannie Bay Salmon Enhancement Society. They've requested brushing on one of the access roads to Langley Lake. Um, and so that's something we're going to do to help support their initiative to store juvenile Kohat Lake this summer. Um, just want to touch on these activities um, we did share with the CBRD water purveyors uh, last year at our annual meeting and again this year. So just wanted to touch on Comox Valley communities. Um, our private managed forest lands uh, play a critical role in the uh, Comox Valley in terms of promoting tourism and the economy. Um, just two examples, we signed a new agreement with United Riders of Cumberland and also an MOU last year. The photo on the upper left is Mosaic staff that live, work and play here in the Comox Valley. Uh, UROC folks and Village of Cumberland folks out for a ride to celebrate those agreements. So uh, most of those trails are on our private managed forest lands and provide huge benefits to the valley. Similarly, we renewed an um, access agreement we have with Mount Washington. So uh, if you're downhill skiing or cross-country skiing at Mount Washington, there's chances that you're on Mosaic private managed forest lands, but um, it's an exciting relationship and ongoing uh, commitment there to support recreation in the Valley. Um, along with that, some of the uh, events and activities that take place on our lands, um, we often donate to local uh, community groups. So the photo on the upper right is of myself in the Forbidden Gravel series uh, rep, uh, providing a donation to the Cumberland Food Share. So uh, it's a great opportunity for us to give back to the Comox Valley communities in that way as well. Um, in terms of communication and collaboration, last year, Mosaic led uh, a Comox watershed tour with uh, CBRD staff, Village of Cumberland staff, and it was with the uh, University of Alberta, 20 master's forestry students and uh, water treatment um, students. So it was a great opportunity to see the, see the new water treatment facility. Uh, have a stop at Comox Lake and talk about sustainable forest management and how we manage uh, the values that we're involved with. Uh, we stopped at Perseverance Creek to um, talk about some of the historical turbidity water quality issues um, there and also at the boat launch to view all the recreation that happens there in the summer. So 
So oh, we was, have 30 seconds left. Great, thanks. So it was a great tour and uh, great collaboration and communication. Mosaic is also at the table with the Perseverance Watershed Initiative. And I think folks are aware of the funding that is available there for some of the work on Perseverance. So um, we'll be doing everything we can to support that. And the last thing I wanted to touch on is Every year and throughout the year, Mosaic works with water purveyors, CVRD, um, Village of Cumberland, um, whether it's our annual meetings, sharing plans, uh, field tours, um, phone calls, conversations, and you name it. So lots of communication happening throughout the year with the different groups. Um, with that, I just wanted to thank everybody for your time. And um, Molly and I would be happy to answer any questions if there should be any. Thank you. Thank you. And we do have a question from Director Arbor. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to Molly and Colin for coming to see us. And I know you're both professionals and really uh, excited about your work and about the work of Mosaic. And I know that the comments I'll make, you won't take personally because we know we have some disagreements not um, that are not professional in nature, but I think is more contextual in nature. Um, I, I'm still a little bit uh, reeling from the fact that there's more plans um, for logging in the lake, in the uh, Langley Lake watershed. Uh, I don't believe we still we still don't have a memorandum of understanding around all this. Um, I know you've got your SFI certification, I, but if you know with indigenous relations and the rest of it, I think um, I'll still encourage you to pursue FSC certification at some point in the future, which I think is a much more robust non-industry led certification scheme. The biggest thing I have is not with you. I'm getting extremely frustrated with the province that are still um, sitting on the private forest lands review. We know that standards of forestry are lower on province on, on, on the private forest land than on crown lands. I want to remind ourselves, and I'll have a question at the end. Uh, local government, the, from, from Victoria all the way to Campbell River, they, their feedback is summarized by the province in that process in 2019. There is a high level of concern among local governments who responded that private managed forest land should be managed to consider cumulative effects and better protect community watershed, as well as hold private forest land owners with forestry operations more accountable. They argue that local government should have greater authority to oversee forest operations that affect communities. Indigenous nations also responded to the province on this. They said, generally, indigenous nations are concerned that private managed forest lands owners are not managing their lands to sustainable forest practices standards, and they are frustrated with the lack of protection of their traditional use and spiritual sites. To that, the private managed forest land owners association responded their comment to government. There is general support for the current program and the need to continue being exempt from local government bylaws that may impede forestry operations. So that is the status of our relationship at a big picture level. There's people like me that think that communities should own their entire watersheds. I'm not likely to see that in our lifetime. But when I see small watershed of 700 hectares on which communities are dependent for their water and necessarily logged, that's a huge aggravator in our relationship and something I'm not willing to let go. My question is... Please, no clapping, thank you. My question is, are you willing to go back to your association and change your tune and support local government indigenous requests in regards to the Private Forest Lands Manage Act? Or are you gonna stick to your guns? Thank you for the question. Um, so the, the province's process is something that is out of our hands. We provided input and, and we also await um, uh, the finalization of that work. Um, in terms of our work with local governments, you know, we, as Colin mentioned, have regular communication and collaboration with the staff here at the CVRD. And I uh, like to think that we are very responsive to staff requests and staff um, concerns. And the same goes for uh, Indigenous nations. We have many memorandums of understanding with Indigenous nations throughout our ter the, the territories that we work in, and our relationships with them are very important. And we work with them, you know, mosaic to the nation on their specific interests and needs and concerns and opportunities to move forward together, whether that's through business development, through community support, through some of the things I spoke about, internships and, and uh, increased access to the forest sector. So all of those relationships are very important to us. We operate to uh, the legislated standard and above, 
and um, are very proud of the work that we do. Thank you. Director Kerr. Thank you. Uh, in your delegation request uh, to speak to us tonight, you list the primary purpose of your organization as sustainable forest management, not making a profit, not providing jobs, but sustainable forest management. That's quite a claim. Um, so I drive up and down the mountain three times a week during the winter, and I can see the rain washing the soil down the mountain where logging just happened a few months ago. On a recent float plane trip, I saw from the sky large scars of clear cuts across the region. Nothing I see with my own eyes looks sustainable or responsible. One of your maps tonight even showed an area of plan logging this spring within the Langley Lake watershed. So brushing out an access road, donating to a community group, or buying carbon credits doesn't undo the harm that these clear cuts are doing to our watershed, our watershed, our grandchildren's watershed, not your watershed. So could you clearly demonstrate, clearly demonstrate how you are managing forests responsibly and sustainably, how you are protecting our watershed here in the Comox Valley? I'm not asking you to just tell us about it. I want you to prove it to us. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I think the, you know, the, the place that I'll start is that Mosaic and our predecessor organizations have been practicing forestry here on the coast for over a hundred years. And we are uh, a business of continuous improvement. So as science uh, provides us more information, as our knowledge base grows, as we you know, change with the changing expectations of the public, our practices improve over time. And I feel confident that the practices we have today are, are better than our, than our predecessors and that will carry on. Um, in terms of watershed management, you know, we have a comprehensive system. It involves professional oversight, third-party experts, the input of existing research and the investment in new research. So when you see at a site level our landscape change, like it happens when we harvest, um, that's a, a point in time that will evolve as those trees are planted and they grow up and become a new forest. And at the watershed scale, we have all kinds of systems and controls and oversights in place to make sure we're managing that so that values like drinking water and values like uh, wildlife habitat are a part of the decision. The, decision-making process. So uh, nothing that happens is without long-term planning in mind, without the investment of our owners who are have long-term returns in mind. We are absolutely a business and our organization benefits pensioners in BC and across Canada. So us being sustainable and providing those returns over a very long period of time is our responsibility and our mandate. Thanks. Well, thanks for being clear about that. <laughs> um, uh, I also wanted to ask about um, the Big Coast Initiative. Sure. Um, I was just wondering, with a 25-year protection on the trees, mm -hmm. how is that different from your regular harvest schedule? Sure. Um, are you prioritizing ecologically sensitive areas? Yep. Or is it more an operational exercise that these are just areas that are inaccessible or very expensive to get to? Sure. Um, and part of the reason why I'm asking is why not prioritize our watersheds? Mm -hmm. um, recently, um, Mosaic logged above Allen Lake, directly above um, our drinking water uh, reservoir. Mm -hmm. And I walked up there and it is the same old type of clear cut that's been happening for a hundred years. Um, and when you uh, profess the best science and have all these professionals on staff, but then what I see on the ground is so counter to that. Um, like we know that if you stagger the age of the trees, that that's better fire protection, it's better um, habitat. Um, you know, there's so much better science, I guess, that that could be employed. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering sure. um, about Big Coast. Yeah. Um, yeah. How is it? How is it being implemented? Sure. It's a great question. So Big Coast, we cannot sell carbon credits without proving that those areas were planned to be harvested and that they were available to be harvested. So 
um, part of the audit process that has been underway for um, a year is verifying that these areas are a removal from our baseline harvest plan. And so that means that our cut level across our organization, our harvest annual harvest production has to go down. And so it does commensurate with these, this land-based removal. And when we were selecting the areas for this project, we prioritized old forests um, because of their value for all of those co-benefits that I mentioned, wildlife habitat, um, biodiversity, wetlands, watersheds. And when we were designing the project, we did try to put as much of a concentration of these areas in drinking watersheds that we could. So as I said, you know, the Comox Valley watershed is very big, about 4,000 hectares of the Comox Lake watershed um, is in Big Coast. And that's not including, you know, the, the broader CBRD. So there are more uh, hectares in the broader CBRD as well. So it was a detailed multi-year process to select these areas. Um, you know, there is there was determinations on um, if these areas were truly accessible and a part of our baseline harvest plan, because we have to pass that test with the third party verifiers that we are making a change from our normal course of business. Um, so, uh, you know, this project is unique. It's the largest of its kind in Canada. Um, and on the voluntary carbon market, um, it it provides us a win. It, you know, it, it is a good tool for land management in these areas where there are, you know, community watersheds, um, wildlife habitats, old forests. So that's the decision-making process that we went through to arrive at those 40,000 hectares and, and um, you know, with uh, the hopeful success of this project, we'd like to see more opportunities, not just for Mosaic to expand in this space, but for other private landowners, Indigenous nations that have treaty lands to be able to join projects like this and specifically join into the kind of framework that we've set up with Big Coast so that um, other landowners, tenure holders can gain that benefit as well. So, um, I hope that answered your question. Thanks, Molly. Um, just one more thing to leave you yep. with is um, Director Arbor mentioned that Crown land regulations seem to be increasing more and more. They've been reviewed and increased, mm -hmm. but private match forest land regulation has not changed at all, despite having been reviewed and all the feedback. Mm -hmm. And I think it would help if it came from the forest industry. Um, you know, you're doing above and beyond the regulation. Why not? Yeah increase the regulation sure. and yeah. make that known to the province that that is what you want sure. because you want to work with our communities. You want to work yeah. with our local government. So that is my request to you. Thank you. We will take that. <laughs> Thank you. I don't see any further questions. So we're on receipt. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Oh, no, no, you cannot. All in favor of receipt. Thank you. Okay, so we're moving on to our next delegation. We have Dawn to Dawn Action on Homelessness Society, Lee Everson and Grant Schilling. Moved by Arbor, seconded by Helene. Okay, thank you. Welcome. <laughs> we have quite the crowd to present to you today. Uh, so you just need to press the button and I can turn your mic on for you at the bottom, at the base. Yeah, there you go. Hello, Gila Kessler, Nukuam Grant, Ulan Glasa Tanalach. Hi there, my name is Grant Schilling. Um, I'm grateful to be here today. I'm grateful that we're all here today. I'm grateful for Jesse's artwork to remind us of whose land we are on. Um, I'm going to speak to you today about Yukwasawagalus, which is a Dawn to Dawn initiative. Um, it's a peer supported safe housing for queer youth, 16 to 28, um, who are disproportionately represented in the homeless population. Um, I'd like to give you some rationale for how I arrived at that, which involves a personal story, which 
is as difficult as speaking Kwakwala for someone who's a non-Indigenous speaker, which puts us in other people's shoes. So I'd like to share a personal story. We're going to go way back in the dawn of time, um, 1985, when I was even younger than I am today. Um, and I had the good fortune to be um, fall in love with a man and move in with him. And um, life was great. It was pre-AIDS epidemic. Uh, I was working in nightclubs and it really was a gay old time. It was really um, an eye-opener for someone who hadn't been involved with a man before. And it was a great opportunity to really partake in what I would call so much unique joy, unique to me. Um, and then things began to change. Um, and we first called it the gay cancer. And you'd see people on uh, English Bay and stuff with uh, marks on their face, which was the first signs of Kaposi sarcoma, which is a indicator of uh, AIDS. And uh, the person I was with, his name's Oraf. Um, we had a dear friend who was just one of the most talented people I know named Billy Jean. And Billie Jean was one of the first people I know to succumb to AIDS. And um, Orof was terribly afraid of death and wouldn't go visit people in the hospital. And I was always telling him that we had to go, we had to go visit them. And when we went to go see Billie Jean, we were greeted by a group of protesters who were chanting, no more faggots. And you know, talk about insult to injury. It was just, it just was shocking. Um, on another personal level, I'm the product of a family of the Holocaust. And I have found that language finds its agents. So when you start speaking words of hate, political movements and others will form behind that. So I'd like to flash forward to a couple of years ago, when someone who identified as a community leader felt comfortable speaking in transphobic language online and defended themselves by saying they had the right to freedom of speech. Well, it's never a matter of freedom of speech. It's always a matter of what you do with it. So it was a very upsetting time and I decided to do some research with regard to queer folk, especially young queer folk and homelessness. And I discovered that queer folk were three times as likely to be out on the street. And the reason for that is this sort of the no more faggots line that Orif and I got when we went to the hospital, is that often family members would be intolerant of how their children were presenting. And the next step was the street for them, couch surfing, then the street. When you end up on the street, your chances of uh, graduating high school decrease incrementally. Um, your chances of being safe decrease, and uh, you're, you're at risk at that point. Now, the only people who exceed queer youth in terms of homelessness are indigenous people, which is just mind blowing. There's 5% of Vancouver Island identifies as indigenous, and yet 40% of the homeless population identifies as indigenous. So again, I pay homage to Jesse to remind us of whose land we are on. And I'm really pleased that the Dawn to Dawn and Kukwa Sawagalus, in addition to having the support from you folks, and I'd like to say, Mulan, thank you for your support, CVRD, with regard to our project. We have the support of hereditary leadership. And hereditary leadership is really the key to understanding our relationship to this land. So um, I'd like to invite you on April 14th, we're gonna be at the Sid Williams Theater and there's going to be a movie, and my former partner, Orof, his photographs are featured prominently in it. 
he his work is displayed about someone named Olive, who was the most unique individual I ever met in the early 80s. And this film is about Olive. And um, Billie Jean, who I mentioned, is featured in this movie, which is just a thrill to see her again. So April 14th and 15th, we're having two events. One is the film about Olive. April 15th is a drag show. And I really encourage you to come to both. And um, I'd just like you to think about walking in someone else's shoes. And I, it's, it's baffling to me why in this day and age we're, 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 we're still worried about how the other people present, other choices people make, and their free will. And I know that the Comox Valley feels differently. So I'm grateful for whatever support you can offer to Gukwasa Wagalus. And um, thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Thanks, Grant. So unfortunately, you've only left here with three minutes, so. <laughs> Which is fine because he covered everything. Okay. <laughs> so my paper is now voice. Um, I do, would, I would like to say um, that I am grateful that we have this opportunity to speak with you and with your extended audience today. Um, and Don to Don is very grateful for the commitments that the CVRD has made towards equity, inclusion, fighting discrimination, and supporting affordable housing initiatives, um, plus supporting KFN initiatives. We value the strong positive relationships that have been built between Don to Don and the CVRD. And again, we are grateful for the support that Don to Don has secured through the Comox Valley Housing Coalition. Um, as Grant was mentioning, we have the event. I've got posters. Sid Williams Theater. Um, you can get your tickets. You go to dawntodawn.org, get your tickets. Um, and I will leave you with a few hard copy of the PR package for Gukwitzawagalus. Great, thank you. And if anybody has questions. Okay, I'll open up to the board. We do have a question, Director Morin. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, unfortunately, I'm in, out of town on those dates, but oh, I'm wondering if there's another way to watch the film. And um, and uh, I'm sure that there may be opportunities to maybe purchase t uh, tickets for people that aren't able to afford or something like that so that I could, me and others could, or I and others could uh, maybe contribute in that way. Will there be another opportunity to see the film or... And um, is that okay to, to contribute in that way to maybe help somebody else attend? Um, we actually have, Grant has a lead on another film and actually have the person come and share. So we're kind of in that conversation as well. Um, we recently did a talk um, on um, an Indigenous perspective on empathy with Hereditary Chief Wadley Speck. And it was super well attended. Mm -hmm. And everybody's really, you know, wanting more of that um, that type of content. Mm -hmm. So we're working on that. And absolutely, buy tickets away and give them away to your family and friends. That'd be wonderful. I can always put them on will hold and we can just have, I can direct some of my peeps to go and say that there'll be tickets there for them. Yeah, I thought maybe if um, if I, myself or others contribute, just gave them to you, then you would maybe find, you know, know of people that uh, you could give them to. Thanks. Okay, um, I do see one more. Director Hillian. Thanks, Chair. I, I just wondered if uh, you wanted to uh, say something specific about the actual project. Uh, you're, you're planning to build a house uh, that would uh, support uh, uh, queer youth, and uh, maybe you could say something about uh, the project itself, what, uh, what it will consist of, how large it'll be, what the time frame is, that type of thing. Um, we were talking about building a house, like purchasing land and then building. Um, but because, as we all know, the land um, availability in the Comox Valley is hard to come by, especially one that we need it to be quite specific. Um, these youth, they probably don't have a car. Um, some of them may and may not be in school. Um, so we wanna make sure that it is close to services, a bus system, downtown, all that type of thing. So we are looking into actually purchasing a home and doing renovations. And um, of course, 
um, housing markets have fluctuated. Unfortunately, interest rates have gone up, but our housing costs have come down. So um, we actually have a couple of homes that would be that are very suitable and wouldn't require too much in renovations. And Great. And, and, and if anybody wants to help out, uh, how do they get in touch and what sort of uh, support are you looking for besides cash? Um, we are going for 1.5 million. Um, once we have the home purchased and we start working with renovations, of course, there's going to be like your everyday household furniture, you know, that type of thing that we'll need to fill the home. It'll also be linked to services. So counseling, um, medical, whatever, then the support services that we already currently have um, in the Valley. And the home is, it's well housed for youth and a peer support worker. So that peer support worker will work with them and help guide them. So connect them to doctor's office, connect them to school, to college. Maybe they need a resume done, whatever. So that peer support worker will work within the home and with the youth. And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, um, Grant, uh, the incredible example you provide through your uh, compassionate outreach and your tireless advocacy for uh, all of those uh, vulnerable people on the streets. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you do and thank you for this project. I don't see any further questions. So thank you so much for your presentation today. I'll just say that you need water to make rainbows and that's that's. <laughs> Okay, so we are on receipt. Um, it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. So that brings us to our third delegation. It's the provincial referral for a water license amendment of groundwater extraction at 2400 and 2410 Sackville Road. Thank you, Bruce Gibbons and Arzina Hamir. Uh, moved by Arbor, seconded by Grief. And welcome. You Thank have you. 10 minutes to present and questions after. Lisa, do we have the other uh, document for up on the screen? So we found it, we think. Yep, that's it. Thank you. Okay, uh, directors and staff, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Uh, you've all seen my emails on this subject, uh, so you know my position on uh, bottling of water from our aquifer and about this latest home occupation business uh, fiasco nonsense. I just want to reiterate one thing for the public record, and you can see on the screen there we have a, an excerpt from the provincial application that the proponent made. You can see, see there clearly that his intent is, quote, to have storage for fast loading of the local tank trucks and, quote, filling of a tank truck without exceeding our already granted 10,000 liters per day. We need storage for 20,000 liters, which would be filled over a two-day period. We notice in our area there are many residents ordering bulk water deliveries. These trucks are filled at a standpipe in the city of Courtney. Very clear what the intent is there. In the meeting on March 6th, however, the proponent commented live as follows, quote, we would have people buy vessels from 100 liters to 500 liters, and we would use a small tanker to fill those tanks. The pro proponent also asked to have staff amend the staff report to, quote, remove that we would have local tanker trucks attend the property. We don't need misrepresentation that makes us look bad. He also told directors that, uh, quote, we anticipate using only 2,000 liters per day. The numbers and the purpose in the provincial application totally contradict his comments. The only misrepresentation I see here is from the proponent. The proponent portrays his proposal to get the most possible from the provincial license while trying to convince the CVRD that his proposal is a small family neighbor friendly business that will provide water in small containers to a few customers. The provincial application is the one that will govern how much water he uses and how he conducts his business. 10,000 liter water tanker trucks provide water, bulk water deliveries like those tankers that refill at the standpipe in Courtney. That constitutes a commercial business, not a home occupation business. 
The proponent has misrepresented his proposed operation to CERD directors to intentionally mislead them as to the scope of the proposed business. There's a reason why he wanted the reference to local water tankers removed from the staff report. It highlights his false and misleading comments to the directors. This is not and never will be a home occupation business, no matter how the proponent misrepresents it in his comments. The provincial license is the governing document. This is a commercial trucking business. The reason local governments develop the ability to regulate home-based business is not to develop detailed lists of what is included or excluded. Rather, it is to protect the character of individual neighborhoods, their property values, and people's ability to enjoy their homes. You've all been inundated by emails from concerned residents opposed to this business. I know this because I've been copied on those emails. This home occupation business approval must be rescinded and the application denied once and for all. Thank you. No clapping. No clapping, thank you. Good afternoon, directors. My name is Arzina Hamir, farmer from um, the Comox Valley from Merville. And um, I just want to thank, first of all, Bruce for providing me with some time to present to you um, on a side that maybe I have a little bit more experience closer to yours, um, having recently been on, on your side of the table. What I think might have been missing with um, the, the decision that the rural directors made was the context of this application and the context of bylaw 520 and the intent of that bylaw. The brief that you were provided with this application described the previous application, the history of the proponent until that file was decided on in 2019. What the report failed to say was how many people filled the CVRD rooms, just like we have today, in opposition to that file. How many people wrote to the directors, to the newspaper, and to anyone else who would be listening to say that water extraction and sale from the aquifer was totally unacceptable? Please refrain, you're taking time away from our presentation. The report also failed to record how Comox First Nations previous referral to that original um, application was that they were adamantly opposed to the original application. There's then a three year gap in the report until 2022. And I just wanted to provide a bit of context into that gap. So first of all, the board received in about 2019 the Solom River Watershed Study, which is particularly a study about the agricultural water demand in the Solom River Watershed. And I'm just going to summarize it by saying that it said that if we want to see a 20% increase in food security in the Comox Valley, and we know how little we produce in terms of food already, so just a 20% increase is not a lot, it would require a 500% increase in water demand. And that demand would not be coming from surface water because our surface water is already oversubscribed. That demand would be coming from the aquifer. The second thing that was missed in that study was the whole process of the amendment of bylaw 520. Two things happened in during the amendment process. First of all, the uh, bylaw 520, the amendments that were made were done in order to support agriculture. Secondly, the amendments were made to remove the possibility of water extraction from the light industrial definition. Why, was, why were both of these amendments made? Primarily because the community is asking for this. So it was put on to staff to make those amendments to ensure that uh, agriculture was supported and water extraction was removed. Lastly, there were also resolutions made and endorsed by this board to both AVICC and UBCM to ask the government, the provincial government, to stop the, the extraction and the sale of groundwater. 
Now, sadly, our provincial government seems to have a split personality, and I'm going to echo some of the comments made by Director Arbor earlier, whereby on one side, it says that it's trying to promote food security and water security, but on the other hand, it provides licenses similar, I see, to what they've done for Mosaic. I'm going to just mention that I know many farmers who have been waiting multiple years in order to get their own water licenses in order just to irrigate their crops. And yet a license like this to, the, to Sackville Road has been endorsed and supported almost magically out of, um, out of thin air. Communication from the regional district has noted that water licenses are not the purview of lo local government, and that's true. But as with Deepwater Recovery in Union Bay, Similar decisions have been made where the RD has decided to take a stance against the decision by higher levels of government and push back. Local government does not have a say in water licensing, but it does have a say in land use. And squeezing this application into the home occupation definition goes against everything that this community has asked of you. Our local government, and it creates an incredibly dangerous precedent for resource extraction under that section of bylaw 520. So I'm just going to end up with saying, coming back to the intent, does the decision recently made at electoral areas uphold the intent of how, how bylaw 520 was amended? Does it support agriculture? Does it support the extraction of groundwater? I believe it fails on both. And I hope that the, the, the directors who are in charge of this decision will reconsider that decision and support the intent of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Please refrain from clapping. We need to allow for discussion. I'm willing to take questions. Okay, Director Grieve, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, I think we need to publicly acknowledge the tireless work by Bruce and Nicole over the past, what, six years now on this file. Um, I think we, we, you do deserve a, a, a salute, some gratitude for the passion and commitment you've shown since 2017. Um, countless ministry staff, and how many ministers now? Two or three? Three. Three ministers. You've outlived them all. Um, I think that uh, uh, Narzina and I uh, were quite dumbfounded by when we first found out about the uh, the license originally. And in fact, our uh, our our newly elected MLA uh, was totally oblivious to it. So Still. we were sitting at the board. Uh, director Rod Nickel was uh, director for Area B at the time. And uh, just to, in, to be fair, uh, I was the chair. I turned it over to, uh, to Rod to run because I, it was alleged that uh, I was biased right from the get-go. Um, in fact, I just wanted you to know that the tie award today was a gift from Arzina and Neil when their big bear dog bear inadvertently got his claw stuck in my old tie. <laughs> but uh, I think I speak for the entire board when I say the, that this board has consistently supported sustainable climate action, especially in response to the use of water in all our policies. And I do applaud you for not framing this issue in a simplistic two-dimensional black and white car caricature like some people would. So you know that uh, after all these years of unsuccessfully trying to get the provincial ministry to reconsider their issuance of the, the Sackville property owner's water license, the public here is frustrated and angry, and that's totally understandable. But do realize you're among friends here. The only thing we differ on is interpretation of a bylaw. One is right, the other is legal. Thank you. Please refrain from making noise. Thank you. Sorry, is that a question? 
I didn't hear a question in there. And then, yeah, so I did ask a question about how many ministers it's been. Um, oh, that's very so funny. You've written away to the ministers. I'm just wondering, have you had uh, contact with our Comox First Nation as well over that period of time? I have requested meetings uh, with, with Chief Rempel, uh, and uh, at, at no time did she uh, agree to a meeting. I just called a few days ago to meet with Chief Rempel and found out that Chief Rempel is no longer the chief. So I have a request then to, to meet with the new chief uh, and have not heard back from them. Uh, but to, to answer some of your other comments, uh, I have been fighting for five years uh, to the, with the provincial government to overturn their policy to uh, basically give away our water uh, under the Water Sustainability Act when, when the act was intended to be a protection of our water. Uh, and I've, I've acknowledged every time I've spoken to you and every time I've spoken to the, the directors and the board and the staff, I acknowledge that it is a provincial government responsibility, the extraction of the water. But you guys have the ability to regulate what goes on above the rock ground and, and what kind of works are allowed in a home occupation business. And you've seen, I, I alluded to it earlier, you've seen all of the emails there are a lot of emails coming into you folks. I, I know it, and I've been copied on them. My computer is full of them. There is some very eloquently written emails. There's a lot of investigation being done. None of it is just tree hugger stuff. None of it is just emotional. People are telling you that you have the right and the obligation to, to do this, to protect uh, our, our home environment, to protect our neighborhood. We have a right to live okay, in our Bruce, I think you're going beyond the bounds of uh, response to a question. I don't agree, but I respect your, your you. decision. Thank you. Home occupation should protect us, not Bruce, a commercial business. There are no further questions, so we are going to end the discussion there, unless any directors want to speak. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. So we are on receipt, and uh, receipt is um, a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Thank you. So we're moving on to reports. We have the Black Creek Oyster Bay Service Committee minutes from March 6th. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Move recommendation. Sorry. Recommendation one moved by Greaves, seconded by Grant. And we just received the delegation, and there is a report to come later uh, on the topic. What, another two okay. years? Thank you. So we're on recommendation one. It's been moved and seconded, and it is regarding the operating financial plan from 2023 to 2032. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. What mic is it? 21. 21. 21. Okay. Chair, I, I, I'm wondering if you could explain to the large uh, number of people we have in the gallery that uh, the item they have come here to hear about is still on the agenda further down. And uh, um, Maybe just some clarity about what exactly we're doing right now to avoid misunderstanding and the disruption that will prevent the business from being carried on. Thanks. So, um, as you can see on the agenda, we just had the delegations portion. So we had three separate delegations and the um, Merville issue is coming up in, I think, a couple items in, in the agenda. And that is where the vote will take place. It will be a vote on the uh, home occupation and whether um, the use fits in within home occupation. It will be a vote of the areas only, A, B, and C. So if you wish to stay for that, you are welcome. And if you wish to exit, you are also welcome. May I propose that we vary the agenda to bring that item right away? Yeah. Yeah, we've already moved and seconded recommendation one, so we will need to dispense with that. 
And again, this is for operating fin financial plan. It's a vote of C and D. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, so we've moved the minutes from March 6th, and it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. And before we uh, begin um, to ensure fairness in our decision making process, I would like to invite the proponent to provide comments or representation to the board concerning this referral. Mr. McKenzie, this is not an opportunity to ask questions of individual directors, staff, or members of the public, but to briefly provide any additional information to the board. As per my opening comments, please ensure your remarks remain respectful, civil, and focused on the details of your application. Is he in the boardroom? Mr. McKenzie, for your benefit, you missed the opening remark. Um, what was said is this is not an opportunity to ask questions of individual directors, staff, or members of the public, but to briefly provide any additional information to the board. As per my opening comments, please ensure your remarks remain respectful, civil, and focused on the details of your application. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Chair Keller. Um, I wanted to speak specifically about the zoning bylaw, but I would like just to start uh, that uh, there have been no misrepresentations. Everything that I've put forward is my right. I'm not finalized on the license. Anything that would be considered concession would still revolve around 10,000 liters a day, although we know we'd probably use about a dozen bathtub fulls. So um, I'd like to talk about, I heard um, Director Arbor allude to something that caught my attention in the last EASC committee meeting. And I'd like to remind everybody here that 19,000 years ago, the Vashon Glacier extended across Western North America from Alaska to Puget Sound. Hear me out, please. Please, Gallery. Be quiet. And it took 4,000 years to recede. And if you look outside, there's a remnant of the last ice age it's sitting there staring over this valley right now. And when it receded, it left deposits of what is called the Vashon Till. And there are thousands of these deposits. They're considered to be aquitards and they refill every year. They're considered by the ministry to be young aquifers and not to be confused with what's going on down in California. That ice age actually didn't extend to that point and did not leave these vast deposits of aggregate that contain the water. For millennia, there will be water under the Comox Valley. The, the ministry knows this. The city of Chilliwack, Langley, Abbotsford, all get their municipal water from the Vashon Till. And I would also like to remind everybody that the 148 square kilometers that's beneath the Comox Bay to almost the Oyster River is exactly just that. It's a protected, confined aquifer. It's like an hourglass that doesn't empty before the coming of the rains. And the idea that 10,000 liters, when agriculture measures an acre feet, 10,000 liters is going to cause harm to anything, not my nearest neighbor, and the ministry's confirmed this. Could you speak to the home occupation use? Because that yes, is what absolutely. we're discussing today. Which is also very important, because if you look to your regional partners, you will see that all water bottling of groundwater, water takings, are conducted by families on their own property, which is the source of the water. None of these have ever been sold to conglomerates. None of these have ever had impacts. And as a matter of fact, there's never been uh, this much opposition to any of those applications. And it, just by chance that in Director Arbor's electoral area, there are two operating today, 
one on Point Road, bottling five gallon bottles of water as a home occupation, and one on White Duck Road, Diamond Springs, run by Mr. Ken Giles. And there has been no impacts, no problems, and that's been going on for over 20 years. And the idea that just because I have a license for any amount of water, which is specifically 10,000 liters, I'm zoned for horticulture, aquaculture, agriculture, fish farms. And if I chose to put my energies into any one of those activities, I could use 10,000 liters a day. Just because there's a negative connotation associated with water bottlers, and we've gone through all this, that's not us. There are no tank trucks. We specifically reserve the right to take the leasehold anywhere we choose to move that 10,000 liters, and that's why there's a tank truck. We can operate as any other operation that's home industry, and to, to say that we're gonna cause harm to something that contains 23 trillion liters of water, and I don't know what fraction 10,000 liters is out of that, the annual recharge is proven, and so are all of the other thousands of Vashon till aquitards. There is no threat to water in the Comox Valley. This is all a guise under the climate emergency. If you take the volumes of information that exist before all this climate threat propaganda started floating around, okay. you will see... I think you've uh, made your point sufficiently. Thank you. All right, so we don't have a, a motion on the floor. There is a recommendation. Move Moved by Grieve, seconded by Hardy. It is a vote of the areas only. A, B, C. Any further discussion? Director Arbor. Madam Chair, just for the benefit of the crowd, the uh, the resolution is the recommendation of the Electoral Area Services Committee. It is on the screens and it relates to interpretation of a home occupation use. So for the benefit of those in the public. Director Kerr? I heard Doc, uh, Director Arbor's uh, name. He turned his okay. off. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank everyone in attendance today, um, for those watching online and Everyone else that has, you know, taken the time to write letters. Um, citizen engagement is important, uh, more so now than ever. Uh, you may have heard recently on the news that experts are predicting that global freshwater demand will outstrip supply by 40% by 2030. That's just seven years away. And I understand that this issue is going to be voted on by just the three electoral area directors and not by any of the directors from Courtney, Cumberland, or Comox. But this issue does affect everyone living in the Comox Valley and the surrounding area, so I, I will uh, say a few words. I've also been informed that this is merely a land use issue for the CBRD, and the real authority over water use and this issue lies with the province. However, as we've seen from the forestry industry, we simply can't trust the province to protect us against the obscene levels of resource extraction. So if this water license approval goes forward, what are we going to tell the farmers when the next drought or heat event occurs in a few months? What will we tell neighboring residents whose wells go dry this summer? For those of you attending this meeting who are concerned with water supply, I hear you, I'm with you. And if I wasn't sitting in this seat as an elected official, I'd be in one of those seats. However, for those of you that are in attendance or watching online, and as someone who agrees with you, I implore you and I ask you two things. Number one, please respect how difficult this has been for the three electoral area directors. This is a complicated issue and they do not have decision-making authority over all areas that you're concerned about. While you may disagree with them, they do deserve your respect, both in public and online. And this leads me to point number two. There's a lot of energy in this room. Some of you are mad, some of you are sad, but I do implore you, use your energy, your passion, your time, and direct it to the true decision makers on this issue. Please, please speak to your local MLA, write letters to the minister and the premier, 
lobby the government to change the regulations with respect to water use, bulk water storage, water bottling, and regulations around permitted home use occupations. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Director Grief. I'd like to thank uh, Director Kerr for those kind words. Um, we're making this decision not because we know what's right or wrong, but because we know what we can do and what we can't do under uh, the limited powers afforded local government. Um, should bylaws be reviewed and amended? Yes, often. But in this case, they should be done before there's an application. So now we sit here with uh, with something that uh, can be narrowly uh, interpreted as, as being home occupation, but home occupation is under our bylaws as they now exist. And although it's cold comfort, later on in the meet under new business, I will be bringing forward a motion to request the staff report recommending revisions to bylaw 520 as it pertains to water sales as a home occupation. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't see any further lights. Oh, that's not true. Director Arbor, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, this is indeed a difficult issue. And I think to the applicant, it's it's partly, I think, because your issue um, touches a nerve, as you, as you probably well know, in, in um, anxiety, um, what, which uh, not everyone may believe it, but I, I am part of those who do that um, water scarcity is coming our way. And I hear you around um, the vast hydrology that you speak of. To me, when I make a decision like this, it's, it's also a decision in regards to our bylaw because it, it would also speak to what's currently allowed and whether um, how many applicants, basically most homeowners now could do this, you know, to, to start water sales. And you are correct that in area A, and I would add to your knowledge on Hornby and on Denman, I think you knew about on Denman, but on Hornby as well, we've had uh, private operators that, that supply water. And that's actually a critical need for many residents in those communities, especially as we're facing dry, dry summer. I, I think the public concern is, um, if we look at other jurisdictions around the world that have pursued a private model for water, it leads to bad things. Um, it's uh, If you look in, in South America and Central America where, where private models have, have been implemented, be, over time it becomes a bit of a wild west as water becomes scarce. So I think what you're seeing in, in this room is a lot of people that really believe in water be, be, being publicly managed and including the water system. So when you reference the city of Chiliwak and others, I think people have more con uh, concern. And there's also a lot of doubts about, and I'm starting to be one of those. I, I've always been a believer in government, but I'm starting to have a lot of doubts and a lot of questions for funeral. And, and not just about water, just around their whole licensing process across everything from ship breaking to everything. I think personally that the, the ministry needs new leadership. They need a, a complete overhaul that will reflect the demands of the coming century. I think they live in the past. So that's my view. I know it's not the view of everyone. But what I would say is, so what, what I'm trying to say is there's a policy context to what we're considering today. And I happen to be on the side of, of policy. I think the, the, the province should not. Uh, they should support local government to, pro, to help provide water for their residents. I don't even understand. One question I was going to ask Flynn Rowe is, is um, uh, you know, how do they monitor and, and all the rest of that, right? So there's a lot of questions that I know you probably have answers. Some of the directors may have answers. I don't because I didn't get that opportunity in, in this decision-making uh, process. So we're back to the bylaw. Sorry, I'm a little bit long-winded, but I think the context is very important. Uh, back to the bylaw, it does look, um, I've, been, I've been advised a few times that my interpretation um, has some gaps in it in the sense that Maybe it's not my interpretation that's a gap, as Dr. Grieve is. Maybe it's our bylaw itself that has a bit of a gap in regards to that, in regards to this application that was maybe not anticipated under the home occupation. Um, but to my fellow directors, I, I, still, I still believe that my interpretation is not unreasonable. I actually believe that it's a stretch to put this under home occupation. I've been reflecting, as a, my colleagues, we've landed on slightly different answers and staff as well. I happen to be a little bit in the minority on this, but I, I, 
I believe it's a stretch because I see it as resource extraction more than a trade, a craft, a profession. To me, I see it as re so. Please, please, everybody. No tapping. It's not. It's very intimidating, both for ourselves as elected official, for the applicants, for everyone. So, um, yeah. So I'm a bit nervous about it, but I, I, I because of that, I, I'm, I can't find it in my heart to vote in favor of the application because I think it stretches our bylaw a little too much. Thank you. No. No clapping, please. And I don't see any further lights, so I will call the question. A vote of the areas. All in favor. And opposed, Arbor opposed, and it's carried. And I'll take five minute recess while the gallery uh, exits.
Sewage Commission minutes from March 7th. Go ahead, Moved by Hillian, seconded by Grieve. Thank you. And so the full board, all in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Then we have the Comox Valley Rec Commission minutes from both March 2nd and March 7th. Move uh, moved by Greaves, seconded by Morin. Thank you. Any discussion of those minutes? And is both full board, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. And do we have the staff available for the next? <laughs> um, Madam Chair, could you move on to the Clean Transportation okay. Action Plan? We'll circle back. And then we'll come back. Thanks okay. very much. And that would be Alana Mullaley just commenting on that. Okay, so we will move to item six, which is the 2023 Clean Transportation Action Plan. Uh, moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant. And, oh, that is also Alana. <laughs> yes, that was Alana. Move financial plan. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much, directors. If we could move to the financial plan and then we'll pick up where we okay. left off because I know Kevin is in the room. And due to a very minor conflict of interest in relation to one of the services, I found out I will have to remove myself from the entire budget discussion. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, I can clarify for uh, Director Arbor. It was came about in an EASC meeting where he declared that he has a contract with High Seek, the uh, Hornby Island Economic Development Organization. So he declared that and removed himself from the meeting at that point. So that's that's the nature of the declaration. Okay, and so we are moving to item seven, the 2023-2027 Financial Plan and Capital Expenditure Program. Hillian and Grant, thank you, and over to staff. Thank you very much, and Kevin Duvall is here to introduce the uh, the uh, the financial plan and where we are at, given that uh, the bylaw is on the agenda later on for the first three readings. Thank you very much, Russell, through the chair to the directors. Good afternoon. So yes, I'm here today in advance of presenting the annual financial plan bylaw for your consideration, just to give you a sense of kind of where we are now at and uh, just give you a quick overview on what's contained within that uh, bylaw and then certainly give you a sense of the final next steps in our annual financial planning process. So of course the proposed consolidated financial plan was presented to the board back in late January, January 24th. And after that time, uh, all 102 service budgets were then presented uh, to the various committees, commissions and to the board itself over the next seven weeks through uh, from January 30th through March the 9th. Of course, during those um, many deliberations, there were uh, re recommendations or, or suggestions brought forward by the board. Those adjustments, you know, were certainly taken back and then incorporated uh, were appropriate into the recommended financial plan. And that's why we have that recommended financial plan as part of that bylaw in front of you today. And of course, the annual financial planning bylaw. Um, that's in front today is, is the culmination of all of the extensive work that's been done over these last seven or eight weeks um, and all of the deliberations and discussions that took place over that time. And also, just as a reminder by legislation, the fi final adoption of the bylaw must be completed no later than March 31st. So a copy of this table is in, in the staff report, so I won't kind of go into it in detail, but just wanted to give you kind of a quick overview of kind of what, what the outcomes is. So uh, overall for your 2023 recommended operating budget, we are now at 91.93 million. That's versus 87.11 million at the proposed budget stage. And the difference of that is largely attributed to the prior year surplus carry forwards that have now been confirmed and brought over from the prior year. To give you a sense of some of the financial plan taxation highlights, uh, the overall reduction in the 2023 tax requisition from the proposed has gone down slightly by $96,436 or 0.23%. Uh, that means we are now uh, coming from uh, 41.9 million in, in tax requisition revenue to about 41.8 million. Uh, recommended tax, re uh, tax requisition revenues from for 2023 as compared to 2022, uh, or uh, sorry, compared to the 22 adopted budget are slated to increase by 3.1 million or 10.38%. Now that doesn't equate to a tax 
rate increase of 10.38%. That just means that our total revenues are up that amount. Of course, how that actually hits the individual taxpayer is really dependent on the number of services that each of their individual households receives. And I'll be speaking in a couple of slides uh, shortly, kind of to give the directors a sense of what the individual tax impacts are by jurisdiction. It's also important to note that that amount does not include the planned $900,000 increase in the annual sewer levy, given that's not a tax requisition, but actually a levy based on sewer flows. And that levy is slated to increase from 7.2 million to 8.1 million for the residents of Courtney and Comox. And then lastly, this does not also include the new sole tax supported service that's being introduced to, to the regional district this year. And that is the regional parks and trail service. And that initial or inaugural requisition for 2023 is slated to be 275,000. So to give you a sense of, you know, kind of some of the, the big changes that have occurred between the proposed and recommended budget stage, uh, I've outlined them there and certainly in the staff report, but certainly the, the largest co contributor is the Comox Strathcona Waste Management Service. Uh, there is a reduction in the uh, annual requisition across the five-year plan back to the $5 million level, which is basically the, the, the COVID level that we've been living through for the last couple of years. Some other changes in the financial plan include an increase of $176,000 to the affordable, or sorry, the uh, homelessness support service. That's in 2023 solely, and that's to support uh, a request for additional housing projects. We also saw a $65,000 increase in recreational grant service. That again is a 2023 sole uh, increase, and that's to assist with some increased capital works that are required for the Courtney and District Outdoor Memorial Pool. As directors will recall, there was also an increase of $60,000 in 2023, with a slightly larger increases throughout the rest of the five-year plan to support a new regional social planner position that will be um, put in place this year. With respect to the electoral area administration and election services, uh, there's been a reduction there. Um, initially of about, uh, sorry, I've got my notes here, $91,000 in 2023 and then 50,000 in the subsequent years. And that's due to a streamlined uh, rural area public engagement program that was brought forward and decided upon by the electoral area services committee. Within the Demon and Hornby Island Economic Development Services, we have one-time increases for 2023 of $100,000 in each of those respective services, and those are to support specified requests for affordable housing projects on each of the two islands. And then lastly, uh, the Demon Island Community Facility Service, uh, $40,000 increase in 2023 again there to support a covered outdoor space project. So quickly on the capital side. Uh, we have a question. Oh, certainly. Go ahead. If, if we could slide back. So I just wanted to make sure I understood what I was reading with, re with regards to Hornby Island, Demon Island Economic Development. It's $100,000. Is it for both islands or is it 100000 for Demon and 100000 for Hornby? Correct. It's 100000 each. Each. Thanks. So quickly again on the capital side, the overall recommended uh, capital budget for 2023 is now sitting at 81.85 million. Uh, the recommended budget, uh, in, in addition to the projects that have been presented to you throughout the uh, uh, financial planning process, also now includes any of the budget carry forwards from 2022. Some of the projects of note that we've carried forward budgets for include the sewer conveyance project, uh, the uh, engineered landfill for the uh, solid waste management service, also the completion of the regional compost facility in Campbell River, and then lastly, some of the ongoing Campbell River landfill closure and Comox Valley progressive closure costs. So those have all now been brought into the current financial plan. So what you what I'll be speaking to over the next couple of slides is you know kind of provides a bit of a sense of the tax impact per household by participants. Directors would have received from staff yesterday a copy of the updated house tables as we frame them. And this is based on the now recommended financial plan, is still also based on the current uh, completed assessment role uh, from BC Assessment, as we've yet to see receive the revised role. So just to give you a sense of kind of what the change between the proposed and recommended financial plan is, I've highlighted the, the recommended change in red. 
So as you can see for the city of Courtney, at the proposed budget stage, we were looking at a year over year change of about $72.93. That's when looking at a house assessed at $800,000 this year, that house would have been worth approximately 710,000 in 2022. So trying to give you somewhat of a direct comparison. That's down slightly from what the proposed budget was at 72.93. For Comox, uh, the recommended budget change year over years uh, for that level of uh, household assessment is $67.18. That's down from the proposed budget at $73.18. And then lastly, for the municipalities for Cumberland, we're looking at a, a recommended change of $77.44, down slightly again from the proposed change of $77.52. Moving on to the electoral areas, and we've broken out electoral area A into its various components because there are kind of uh, uh, different services attributed to those. So firstly, for the entirety of electoral area A, so those are all the services that everybody pays into an electoral area A, no matter where they live within that area. There's 20 services designated to that. Uh, the change at the recommended budget stage is $43.18, and that is down from the $57.10 that was uh, uh, noted at the proposed budget stage. As we move into Bain Sound, so that's the Royston, uh, Union Bay, Fannie Bay, et cetera, area, uh, the change at the proposed budget stage was $59.98. That is up slightly now in the recommended budget stage to $63.07. Uh, for Denman and Hornby Island, these are really, you know, impacted by those those previous um, projects that we noted with respect to the affordable housing projects and certainly the, the covered space contribution. For Denman Island, at the proposed budget stage, we were uh, uh, estimating a small decrease uh, of 499. That will now be a, an increase of 147. Moving to Hornby. Looking at a proposed change or a change at the proposed budget stage of $96, uh, we're now looking at uh, a change of about $154. Area B, uh, the proposed change was $120.62, and then we're looking at a, a recommended change of $110.78. So that's down slightly from uh, what it was at proposed. And lastly, for Area C, uh, looking at a recommended change uh, at this stage of 10902 versus a change at the proposed of 104. All of the details are again included in the house tables that have been provided to you, and you'll be able to see it on a service by service basis and really where the, the impactors are. Um, you know, um, a lot of the, the projects that I, or sorry, the uh, tax requisition changes I noted on an earlier slide are really what's kind of driving a lot of these changes. So quickly, just a reminder on the budget uh, public engagement process. So we did enhance that process for 2023. As many of you will recall, we held a, a free virtual public information session back on February 7th called Understanding the Regional Budget Process, Learn the Budget Basics. So that was uh, participated by a number of staff. Uh, also, uh, as normal, we uh, encouraged budget inquiries from the public over the seven week budget presentation phase. And at this point, or sorry, at the beginning of the process, we issued a press release just announcing kind of the kickoff and how people could certainly uh, get involved and participate within the process. Uh, once the budget is formally adopted, we will then um, issue a, a subsequent press release uh, identifying, you know, the, the adopted budget and kind of what the, uh, the overview of that will be. So my final slide just gives you a bit of a, a review and final next step. So as you can see, we've come a long way since the, the start of January. Uh, and that red dot represents kind of this is where we are at now in the process. Uh, the annual budget bylaw has been brought forward today for your consideration for first, second, and third reading. Um, we do have then fourth reading and final adoption slated uh, for this coming Thursday, the 23rd, uh, ahead of that March 31st deadline. Once the budget is formally adopted, there are some final steps staff will be undertaking to fir firmly finalize the financial plan for this year. The 2023 uh, revised assessment roll is due to be received uh, on or after March 24th. Once we receive that, we do a final calculation of the tax requisition apportionments uh, between the various participants when they, within each service. And then we ready our tax requisition submission for the rural areas uh, to the provincial e-tax system by April 10th. That April 10th date is also when we are due to have all of the invoices out to the municipalities for your various respective regional district requisitions as well. 
The adopted budget documents will then be prepared and posted to the CVRD website. And just as a reminder, that will include the full electronic budget binder, which will provide the, the full sum budgets for each of our uh, regional district services, all 102 services. It will include not only the operational plans, but certainly the 10-year capital plans that are associated with any of those services that do have capital. We'll continue to provide also the requisition comparison documents for each jurisdiction's information. And we will also update once more the, the house table document and we'll ensure that gets posted to the website as well. The last piece that we'll also be providing for directors and for the public's information is a full fulsome reserve fund schedule. So that'll outline where all of our reserves for each of our services sit and what the uh, contributions and transfers out of reserves are anticipated to be over the next five years and what those reserve balances are than anticipated to be. And all of that information will be available on our financial planning play page at uh, comoxvalleyrd.ca slash current budget. And that's all I have for the presentation, but certainly more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Kevin. We have Director Grieve for the questions. You got some explaining to do, boy. Seriously though, um, are we then actually going to have in the electoral areas, Traditionally, we'd get a, a pamphlet with our tax notice that had a breakdown of comparatives the year before. And last year, we didn't get that. And I know you could refer to the, the, the website all you want, but I would never see a lot of people still read the newspapers. Through the chair to direct grief, yes, there will be a tax insert. Once again, this year, that tax insert will include those year-over-year -year rate comparatives. Um, you know, certainly we, we heard the feedback from the electoral area directors, and we will make sure those are included once again in that, that handout. Uh, those are due to be uh, submitted to the province by the end of this month, and those will then get incorporated or attached to the rural property tax notices when the province issues those uh, later on in May. Thank you. We have a question from Director Hardy. Chair, I'm just wondering if uh, Director Arbor should be allowed to come back into the room or not. Uh, we haven't voted on budget okay. yet. So. so there's parts of that budget that he shouldn't be involved with, and there, there are other parts that he should be. Maybe I'll just ask Jake Martins to come forward and explain this in the circumstance. Okay. Thanks very much, Jake, General Manager of Corporate Services. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Russell, and through the chair. Uh, yeah, so as, as uh, the CAO mentioned at the beginning, uh, Director Arbor had declared a conflict of interest in regards to his uh, business relationship with the Hornby Island Economic Enhancement Corporation. That was uh, that conflict was declared during the Electoral Area Services Committee meeting. This budget brings together all the various services, including uh, the uh, the service on Hornby Island, which respects uh, high seek. And so uh, in an era of caution, uh, Director Arbor has, has uh, recused himself from consideration of this matter as well. And it's certainly something that we plan to speak with him afterwards as far as uh, business going forward uh, throughout the year. But uh, Did you have a follow-up question, Director Hardy? So would there have been any benefit to his alternate being here? Yeah, we made that offer to to director arbor that, that that could have been done for just even coming in for this meeting yeah thank you uh next we have director morin great thank you chair uh thanks for the presentation uh definitely a little bit easier to digest than the 128 pages <laughs> um just regarding the public engagement piece, I know you had the sessions and my recollection is that there wasn't anything too substantial that came out of that. There were some questions for clarification, but no wonderful, creative, mind boggling suggestions from the public around the budget. I guess I'm just curious um, if there was something like that, how we would incorporate that into, into the plan. Thanks. Uh, thank you through the chair to director Warren. So yes, um, you know, again, in addition to the, um, virtual session that we attended and unfortunately it wasn't as well attended as we hope but you know we will continue to to try to encourage more people to get involved in that process but as far as you know uh inquiries directly on the respective service budgets we only did receive a couple of inquiries through the website portal uh, with respect to that and they were very general kind of you know kind of queries in nature there were also some posts uh to the the uh cbrd's facebook page with in relation to the financial plan engagement 
Um, again, I reported out on, to those in an earlier board meeting just to give you all some of sense of that. Some of them were very much outside of the regional district preview. There was a number of inquiries about road repairs and things of that nature. But uh, yeah, nothing nothing that was you know, really specifically targeted at any one specific regional service. Right. So if you had had, you would obviously bring all that feedback back to us and then we would, I guess, determine if there were some, you know, really intelligent uh, ideas or something, then we would consider those in, in our discussion, I'm assuming. Yes, correct. So at every uh, budget deliberation meeting, we had a, a, a section of the agenda that if there had been any inquiries received, we would bring those forward and disclose those at that time and certainly then give the directors an opportunity to kind of to chew on those and certainly respond if, if they felt appropriate. Great. Thank you. Next, we have Director Hillian. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks to Kevin and financial staff for all the work involved in this uh, process. Um, I'm just curious about, um, there was an amount that uh, had been um, held over uh, related to the Strengthening Communities Grant, a $90,000 amount. Can you give us any information on where that stands just now? Uh, certainly through the chair to Director Hillian. So at this point, we have carried that $91,000 commitment over into the 2023 budget for the Homelessness Support Service. So that is still kind of being sequestered, if you want to use that word, until we do receive confirmation, um, you know, that... Um, you know, that money can be released and, and brought back into or utilized in the service, um, you know, for supporting any other, uh, you know, projects that may come on through the year. We're really just waiting to make sure that the final claim process with respect to that grant as it transferred over to Courtney is complete and that no issues arise that, um, you know, may hinder our ability to uh, utilize those funds. Thanks uh, for confirming that. Um... So um, I just want to speak in support of, of the budget. I know it represents a, um, a tax increase, uh, which uh, in the context of the, uh, um, of the amount, uh, I think is manageable for, for most people. Of course, there'll be some that will struggle with it as, as they do. Um, but I think that, uh, um, you know, we've, we've taken some significant steps. Um, the social planning position, uh, which you acknowledged in your discussion is something that has been talked about uh, for years. And um, I think that we've got an opportunity to, uh, given the, the number of areas where the regional district is being called upon to weigh in on these types of matters, uh, I'm hoping that that's going to provide staff with a, a significant asset that will help in that regard. And um, otherwise, um, I, I think we've uh, been able to uh, um, provide the services that our citizens come to rely upon uh, at a manageable level. Um, so my appreciation in that regard. Thank you, Director. Okay, any further questions? And we are on receipt. It's about the full board, all in favor? Any opposed? And that's carried. Thank you, Kevin. So we have to, uh, Oh, right, there is a recommendation. Thank you. Sorry. Moved by Grant, seconded by Hillian. And the recommendation is to give first, second, and third reading to bylaw uh, 760, which is the financial plan and capital expenditure BRAT bylaw. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. And is there any questions? Director Grief, go ahead. Thank you very much. Well, we're moving first, second, third. My understanding is we can move adoption as long as we have a three-quarter or two-thirds majority. Is that correct? And is there a possibility of doing that, and uh, which would enable us not to have to come back on Thursday? Or is there more order of business on Thursday we have to deal with outside of the uh, actual adoption of the financial um, plan? Madam Chair, there, um, Jake is shaking his head. Yes, with, with two-thirds majority, you can. It's not Two thirds nodding, majority. So That's what I thought. Yeah, nodding his head, not shaking his head. So I, I am going to bring nodding. that forward after this uh, yes. this vote. And um, I just would mention there was one other item that I will ask staff to present as a new business item that we were going to include on the agenda that has a very timely nature to it. Okay. But it's a, a very simple thing that we will introduce to you under new business if you choose later on to do the adoption, and then you won't need to have that meeting on Thursday. Okay. Okay, that answers that question. Uh, so we have 
um, first and second, and it is for first, second, and third reading. All in favor? Any opposed? And that's carried unanimously. So we skipped a couple items before the budget, so we'll backtrack um, to item number five. It's the government advocacy strategy. Second. Moved and, by uh, Killian, seconded by Cole Hamilton. Madam Chair, Christian Weil will present this, but I'll just ask if we just wait our start until Director Harbour returns. I think Jake's going to get him. Okay. Harbour. I don't think that mic is plugged in. Oh, it is, okay. Okay, over to you, Christian. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, this report outlines the preliminary actions to be undertaken on the topics of active transportation, climate crisis response, and housing as priorities for advocacy to senior government is directed by the board at the January strategic planning session. In developing this work plan, staff have considered a number of factors, including ensuring that our asks of the province are focused, realistic, and aligned with the CBRD's strategic plan and ministerial mandates in order to be most impactful, ensuring that the actions proposed can be delivered with our available resources. And this includes working collaboratively with the municipalities uh, where possible in order to bring forward initiatives as a region rather than separate jurisdictions, which has been the advice of ministerial staff that we've consulted with. Understanding that building relationships will take time, the ministries of housing and emergency management and climate readiness are new ministers our new ministry, sorry, and there are also new ministers uh, with the existing portfolios that the CVRD has not previously engaged with. Our recommended strategy is to introduce the CVRD, share our successes and challenges, and learn about the province's priorities and position ourselves for future opportunities. This plan proposes introductory meetings with key ministries to happen this spring and where possible in advance of strategic planning so that the feedback we receive from these meetings can help to inform your decisions, particularly when it comes to deciding on areas of investment for affordable housing. Staff will report out to the board on our progress and initial outcomes of this work plan at the strategic planning session, and then requests for follow-up meetings with ministers and staff at UBCM will be made in June, and we'll report out on those meetings following the conference this fall. And with that, I'm happy to take any of your questions about this approach. Great, thank you. We do have some questions, starting with Director Grant. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm, I'm really happy to see this, actually. This is something that uh, I think has been missing from what we've been doing for a long time. And I think with uh, Premier EB making overtures on all of these, the timing is great, especially when they're bathing in a $2 billion, was it $4 billion surplus, whatever it was. The only thing that I'm seeing in here that I'm not super clear about is safe communities. We've got our top three, and I'm wondering if we could have a 3B, which would be safe communities. I think that of the priority action plans, I think that's the one that uh, probably most people in our community see every day and face every day. And it's a topic of conversation every day. And I think it's a pretty high priority. So I'd like to see us, if we could, put a fourth in, which was safe communities. Um, sorry, under what? Um, so, sorry, look at page, page three. Okay. And then you have active transportation, climate crisis, housing, and, and then safe communities or safer communities. Okay. Just add it to that description under Ministry of Housing. Okay. Thank you. And... Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks. I, I agree with Dr. Grant. I think this is an excellent, excellent report that covers all the points and basis, lays out a really clear timeline. It's like, I love this report, fell in love with it. Um, and I think I even like how you framed how this will need into the next run of advocacy next year. Like that's, anyways, really impressive work. So thank you for that. and. Um, and our leadership will be 
having a lot of meetings, so that's good. Um, I was just going to say uh, a, a little pitch on the uh, an immediate one that's coming, and I, I, I was glad to see the reference to um, asking for the province um, for a more reliable share of um, moving a little bit away from grants and from long-term contribution agreements. That's mentioned in a couple of places. And hopefully all of us are the VAICC and this board has a resolution linked to one of your recommendation on climate, which is to quintuple the amount that the province, so that's our resolution to VAICC, to quintuple the amount that uh, the province is giving to local government to uh, adapt and mitigate to climate change and to put it on a 10-year horizon, which in your report, it's great to see this would allow us to plan better, to make more judicious choices around where we invest monies. So I'm hoping all of you will support that at EVICC, then we can kick it to UBCM and Will can take it from there, so to speak, as being an executive. So um, yeah, just again, no question, just a great piece of work. Dr. Cole Hamilton. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I was just going to say, just in terms of, uh, I agree with uh, what Director Grant was saying, and I think maybe perhaps we could just say, uh, I think safe communities often to people equals just more police. And I think maybe if we could say something, the impact of healthy and safe communities, or perhaps there might be other language, but um, I prefer that we just have, have a slightly wider sort of uh, objective when we're lobbying the government. If that would be a friendly amendment. And the staff feel that they could wordsmith that appropriately? Uh, I, I think so. So I just I just want to confirm um, the priorities of, of housing climate crisis and, um, uh, sorry, uh, climate change, uh, housing crisis, the, the three priorities were identified by the board. Are we asking that we include another priority on its own, or would this be as a uh, part of the initiatives that we bring forward to the housing minister? Well, sorry, I, I was thinking of it as one of its own to add another one because I, I'm not 100% sure how we could fit it into housing. Housing is just a piece of it. And I think, Will, I, I didn't actually hear what you said, but you talked about policing and and I think that there's quite a movement afoot right now in the province to get a much better um, policing contract, I guess, for the, the province of British Columbia with more fairness in how it's de designated out. Um, so I, you know, I see that as a really big piece of this, um, although I think it may be a bigger discussion as well. So, um, but I saw safer communities as being its own separate, its own separate one as a fourth priority. Okay, so I would say we can certainly add that. Um, I would just caution that we um, the priorities that have been brought forward are focused in nature. Uh, we need to keep in mind the amount of requests that we bring to the province, the number of ministers that we're choosing to lobby. And, uh, and and focus our ass in that way. If we're trying to do too much, we may not be uh, as effective. So this strategy uh, really brings together um, our ass to UBCM, to AVICC, how we're working with staff, how we're working with our municipal partners, and how we bring forward these initiatives to uh, the minister. So um, if it's the, the board's request that we add this initial priority, we certainly can. Um, I would just provide that for context. Yeah, as that wasn't my initial understanding that we would add it as a um, a fourth bullet. I, I thought that we were putting it under housing as housing applies to creating safer communities. Um, if we are going to do a fourth bullet, we'd have to have um, a more robust discussion around that, I think. Uh, Director Cole Hamilton. Thanks. I think I was envisioning it as a, a fourth bullet, and uh, I think Director Grant picked up on part of what I was saying, and I think policing is is, is part of you know a part of a, a safer community. But I think just ensuring that it, it's much broader our understanding of what the concerns are in our communities, and most of them are, you know, particularly with a um, circle around around uh, health. And so I think having that health and safety is about the sort of twin objectives of that fourth uh, arm of lobbying. That's what, what I was recommending. Okay. Um, so from for staff's benefit, though, um, if it is a more generalized, what are we specifically asking for from the province? 
Dr. Harper? May I suggest that uh, <clears throat> there just we give staff a month to to look at the health and safety aspect and, and come back with a an addendum to consider for the board. And at that point, we can just amend to, to include that in the in the strategy because making it on the fly tonight may be a little hard. Uh, going back to staff, um, is that um, adequate time for you to come back with what might be included in a, a fourth bullet? I think we can have some discussion and bring something back, yes. Okay, uh, Director Hillian, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Chair. I, I just uh, wanted to add that um, the City of Courtney has done a fair amount of work on uh, on this issue in relation to uh, mental health addictions, housing, um, all kind of under the same umbrella. And I, I think uh, um, it's a good idea to to add this bullet um, to add the regional district's voice to probably every other jurisdiction in the province that is concerned about this. Um, and I think that um, um, staff would uh, would get some support from the city in relation to the material that's already been worked up. Thanks. Great, thank you. So does staff need a motion then? Madam Chair, when it comes to considering the recommendation, um, you could just tack on the end and staff bring back um, suggestions with respect to actioning safer communities as well. Something along those lines. Uh, we're still on receipt, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So we don't have any further lights and we are on receipt. Uh, all, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. And there's a recommendation. Second. Moved with the addition of, um, and that staff bring back um, a report on the action for safer communities. So moved by Arbor, seconded by McCollum. And go ahead, Director Kerr. I, I just uh, reflecting what uh, Director Cole Hamilton said, I think it was uh, health and safety. Is that, would that be in the spirit of the suggestion? Okay. Health and safety, okay. Yeah. Any further discussion? Okay, it's a both full boards. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. We're on to item six, which is a 2023 Clean Transportation Action Plan. Second. Moved by Grant, seconded by Arbor. Over to staff. Thank you very much. And Alana Malayli will introduce this report and the recommendation. Thank you very much, Russell, through Madam Chair. Uh, this report provides you with an opportunity to provide some input to the province on the uh, Clean Transportation Action Plan that the province is currently preparing. And right now, they're doing some uh, stakeholder engagement, specifically with local governments. They've put out a survey, you'll find that in Appendix A, asking us some key questions around some of the challenges and barriers that we have as local government to reducing things such as vehicle kilometers traveled, uh, shifting travel modes within the community, the adoption of zero zero emissions vehicles, um, the use of clean fuels in transportation initiatives, and improving affordability and equity of transportation options. So staff's suggested draft responses um, highlight some of the key actions that this board has taken, such as adopting a corporate fleet policy that prioritizes zero emissions vehicles over uh, internal uh, combustion engine vehicles, um, and also make some of the links to other study work that we've done. Uh, the, the responses suggest that we're seeking, similar to what um, Christiane has just presented to you in terms of um, advocacy, we're, we're seeking funding uh, to support local initiatives, we're seeking provincial support for our plans and strategies and the implementations of, implementation of those plans and strategies, and we're seeking partnerships with, in particular, the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure in order to do things like construct active transportation infrastructure. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And we do have a question from Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Good to see this and the ambitions and targets of the province as well. Um, but I think even the last four years, I think getting there is a little bit of a rocky road. And I'm trying to think, I mean, yeah, I guess you're just seeking mostly feedback in the recommendation to, today, but um, I think it's good to advocate for others as well. 
um, when I was in Toronto last week with FCM, one of the conversation was um, how the utilities, both in Quebec, Ontario and BC, like for us, it's BC Hydro, they don't seem to be fully on it uh, to the extent that they could, if you look at what the utilities say in Norway are doing. And so for them, for the electrification and all that, there's some serious investment that has to do from, like right now we just have one BC Hydro fast charger in town, uh, but we should encourage the government to really push on BC Hydro to really amp up their, their efforts. Um, so it, there's often concerns that we don't have the grid to support the transition. Um, sometimes you get different answers on that depending on where you are. But I think, yeah, to encourage the province to really push BC Hydro and invest in BC Hydro to support the, the transition, both for zero emissions, but also for a clean grid. Um, and that could include reopening um, 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 intakes for community-led energy projects, which they shut down when they shut down the IPP um, because of their concerns over the private sector's costs. So there's a lot to be looked at. And, uh, and for us, I think the main piece, I, I keep going back to our main piece is really that active transportation in, in the Valley and, and pushing that, which links back to our strategy. So I think the, those two rep reports kind of link really well together. That's my feedback. Okay, next we have seat 10, which is, oh, Director Cole Hamilton. <laughs> Thanks very much. I, I just have a brief comment. I was just going to say when I was reading it, I, I was starting to make notes thinking, oh, we should prioritize some of these objectives. And as I read the report, it was exactly what I was hoping it would be. I, I found it really concise. It really emphasized which of those five moves suggested by the province were most valuable in terms of reducing kilometers, uh, encouraging mode shift. And was, uh, I think, made a really um, a strong, succinct presentation of the co benefits there. So, anyway, just really appreciate staff's work on this. It's a very concise pitch for exactly the kind of values we have here. So, thank you. Agreed. Okay, I don't see any. Oh, I do. Director McCollum, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess I just want to chime in too, because I was really impressed with the responses that we provided and um, particularly um, in the final um, response around um, suggestions around affordability, just the fact that it's included that um, the province continually or continues to heavily subsidize and prioritize mm -hmm. infrastructure that's based around the private automobile. Um, that, yeah, there's a lot of um, talk about uh, mode shift, but really when you look at where investments are happening, it, it really is around um, highway expansion. Um, and until we see similar amount of commitment to making our roads safer, um, we're just not going to be able to achieve these goals. So I was really happy to see that sentiment reflected in the response that we're providing in the report. So thank you. And Director Hillian. Thanks, Chair. I, I want to make reference to the United Nations report that uh, came out this week um, telling us that uh, the crisis we're facing is even more grave than we previously uh, had been led to uh, understand uh, and calling upon us to do exactly these sorts of things. And I'm just wondering in that regard where we stand with um, our 52 uh, uh, announcements, uh, one per week, um, uh, which th this would seem to fit into. Uh, is, that, is that going ahead full steam? Uh, yep, uh, we're moving along. A new action reported on every week and definitely we can consider something along these lines in subsequent, uh, subsequent releases or information that we provide. And are, are those being sent to directors every week? Or, or... No, but maybe we'll provide a reminder to you when they do go out, it's posted on our social media. Yeah, so I, I think that would prompt I, you and then you're reminded and can send out something to your constituents or otherwise as well. That would be helpful. So we'll we'll take that into consideration. Thanks very much. Yep. Director Kerr. Thank you. Yes, thanks for the report. I guess a uh, question I have is around kind of the big push for housing and then the big push for kind of uh, the switch to electric vehicles. Um, you know, new buildings that are uh, being thought of and, and proposed and built aren't coming with the same, you know, um, number of electric chargers that we'll, one might expect if if we're all going to be switching to electric vehicles in the next 10 years, um, as the province wants. So um, in talking with uh, one developer, the, the thought was, you know, if you have two or three for a building, 
people will move around and 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 use those electric chargers but but i just see a big like dash and fight after the work day to plug in your car so you know i think best practices might need to be examined and how um you, I don't know, some buildings have installed at least the have, have at least put in an electric um outlet and with the capacity electrical capacity for the owner to um put in an electric charger in each uh parking stall let's say in a parking garage so i don't know um to me that's a that's a huge barrier if i'm moving into a condo and there's no electric charger for my car um i'm not going to get an electric car so i think i think that might be something we want to include in, in that is i don't know if that's building code or building suggestions or best practices but uh, that would be that would be one barrier that we could address thanks <clears throat> Okay. Any further comments? Nope. Okay. <laughs> he changed his mind. Yeah. Director Cole Hamilton. I was going to say, I think that uh, the kind of changes that Director Kerr was talking about are within the purview of local governments in the city of Courtney. We put in standards for bike storage and for uh, EV chargers in multi unit buildings. And it's uh, you know, it does take a bit of time, a bit of consultation, a bit of work from the planning department, but it's something that we all have already within our toolkit, the ability to, uh, you know, sort of future-proof buildings so they're ready for what's coming next. Thank you. Okay. So we are in receipt. It's a vote of full board. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. There's a recommendation. Moved by Hillian, seconded by Arbor, that the CBRD respond to the province clean transportation action plan stakeholder engagement process, and it be submitted um, as of the staff report today. Any further discussion? It's a vote full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. We already did seven, so that takes us to bylaws and resolutions. Amend at second reading. Group 741. Moved by Grieve, seconded by Grant, and that's the Rural Comox Valley Zoning Bylaw Amendment Number Twelve to be amended at second reading to correct the misnumbering of the bylaw. It's a vote of the areas. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Now we're on bylaws for first, second, and third reading. Moved by Grieve, seconded by Grant. That's the Comox Valley Regional District Information Access and Privacy Protection Bylaw for first and second reading. It's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Second. Third reading moved by Grant, seconded by McCollum. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And we're on to bylaw number 760. Oh, oh. Director Arbor, go ahead. Because of a small conflict of interest relating to a contract and one of the services, I will remove myself from. Thank you. We will wait for that to happen. We're on uh, bylaw 760, the Comox Valley Regional District Financial Plan and Capital Expenditure. And it's been moved and seconded for first and second reading. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Third reading moved by Hillian, second by Grant. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Um, so adoption of bylaw 760, which is the financial plan, moved by Grieve, seconded by McCollum. And Madam Chair, this would require a two-thirds majority, and it is a weighted vote. Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And we'll just invite Director Arbor back. And we're on to bylaws for adoption, and we have bylaw number 748. Moved by Grant, seconded by Cole Hamilton. That's the Black Creek Oyster Bay uh, Water Local Service Area bylaw. Yeah. And it's for um, area, it's a vote of area C and D. Would you like to speak to it? Yeah. 
Um, so the board is core. We had we had we had discussed this before that um, being it's only two directors. Um, uh, yes, that director Grieve can vote on it um, as the sole director, and he did, and it's passed. Okay. Uh, bylaw 755 is the Comox Valley Water Systems Regulation Fees and Charges Bylaw, moved by Grieve, seconded by Grant. It's the vote of the areas and it's for adoption. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. And we're on to number six. Bylaw 756 is Union Bay Water Tolls Bylaw. It's moved by Grant, seconded by Arbor. And this is for adoption. It's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. We're on to bylaw 757. Okay. Moved by Arbor, seconded by McCullum. It's the Royston Water Service Regulation bylaw for adoption, and it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Bylaw 758 is next. Oh. Moved by Greaves, seconded by Hillian. It's the Comox Valley Water Local Service Area Parcel Tax Bylaw, and it's a vote of the areas only for adoption. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. And bylaw 759. Moved, Moved by Grant, seconded by Greaves. It's the Black Creek Oyster Bay Water Service Regulation Fees and Charges Bylaw for adoption. It is only a vote of area C and D. All in favor? <laughs> and that is carried. Oh, right. New business item? Uh, Director Grieve first. Okay. Director Grieve? Yeah, I'm the most popular guy in the Comox Valley tonight. So I'm going to bring this forward that under new business, um, I'm bringing forward a motion to request this, a staff report be generated. Uh, reconsidering re, uh, to recommending revisions to bylaw 520 as it pertains to water sales as a home occupation. Okay, moved by Grieve, seconded by Cole Hamilton. And uh, Madam Chair, if uh, staff could just have clarification that are you asking uh, that to be excluded in the home occupation? That that's your, your what you're asking? Well, it, it needs to be discussed. I mean, okay. Do, do we exclude uh, using aquifers to make single malt scotch or just untreated water to be sold? It needs a discussion. Okay, so, so we'll bring back an information report on that matter. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, do we need, because it's new business, do we need to two a two thirds vote to just consider it first? Yeah. Okay. Introduce. Right, so we didn't do that. So we'll um, uh, motion to accept the, the new business. Hillian and Grant, and is there discussion on that? Okay, it needs to be a two thirds vote. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Okay, so we're back to um, the motion uh, that Director Grieve put forward is a request to staff for revisions to bylaw 520. Uh, Director Arbor, I think you are next for questions. Okay. Thanks. And I would assume that this would go back to the ESC rather than the board. And second, if staff can be prepared, just as a heads up to talk about what our OCP update and our zoning bylaw update might look like over the next two or three years, because this issue is triggering a number of other ones for me. Okay, and Director Morin. Uh, thanks. I think Director Arbor just answered my question. So this would go to the EA and it wouldn't come back to the larger board until long after that discussion, I'm assuming. Um, Madam Chair, um, being that it is a matter for the EASC, we, our staff report will go to that committee and they will bring forward a recommendation that would have to be ratified here at the board. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So the motion is on the floor. Any further discussion? Okay, it is a vote of full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. 
And Madam Chair, could staff please ask for your consideration of a new business item? Uh, when you adopted the bylaw for the financial plan tonight, it meant we're not holding a meeting on Thursday and we were going to introduce a brief report on a UBCM committee appointment. So uh, Alana Mullaly has that report to hand out and you can read and consider it. It would require two thirds majority to consider the matter. And we have in that report a recommendation to, to appoint uh, Lucy Kilpatrick to a committee of UBCM. Okay, um, a motion to accept the uh, addendum. Moved by Grant. Thank you. No seconder for the addendum? Oh, seconded by Cole Hamilton. Thank you. And it is uh, a two thirds vote that we need. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Okay, so we'll just have a look at what's being handed out here. So it's just uh, looking for staff representation on the UBCM uh, Committee on Poverty or Provincial Poverty Reduction Advisory Committee. Is there any? Um, yes, yeah, so we should put it on the floor so that we can discuss. Moved by Grant, seconded by Cole Hamilton. Is there any further discussion? Director Hardy? Sorry, the, the very last bullet answered my question. Thanks. Okay. And Director Morin. Great, thank you, Chair. Um, I guess I'm curious um, with our proposed new social planner position. Um, we're naming a specific staff person, but I guess I'm wondering uh, the deadline here, um, just in terms of we did kind of attach that position to the the poverty reduction work. So I was just wanting clarification on um, whether our, so, yeah, you know what I mean. Thank you. It's getting late. <laughs> Over to staff. Thank you. Uh, through Madam Chair to the directors. So our, a couple things uh, that the social planner would work with Lisa. Lisa's already engaged on the implementation of the poverty reduction strategy right now, working with the health network and Tamarack on the, the example that's in this report. So I think you're right. It's a two-year appointment that you be, so the representation is not for CBRD, but representing UBCM. Um, and it's a two-year appointment and UBCM put this call out on the 15th and they would like nominations by Friday. Mm -hmm. So not having that person in place, I think this, this could be a good option for you if you're inclined to, um, if you're inclined to go that route. Okay, thank you. Okay, any further discussion? All right, the recommendation is that Lisa Kilpatrick um, through this uh, CBRD Economic Recovery and Community Resilience. Oh no, she is the <laughs> Economic Recovery and Community Resilience Coordinator and that she be nominated to the UBCM um, Poverty Reduction Advisory Committee. Oh, no, we did move the recommendation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Yes. It's done. Yeah, it's done. So we're moving in camera. Thank you.